Today we're looking at the dialogue, the credo, and this is different than the apology, although it's very closely connected with it, right? Um, you notice there's some narrative continuity. What happened in the apology that we talked about last class, Socrates, what happens to He doesn't get killed in that one. Oh. He, he's on his way, though, isn't he? Yeah. He's on trial, and he's like very, very good. Yeah, he he's on trial. He makes a couple speeches. Um, they're not they're not speeches that are actually going to get him off because he kind of you know pokes at the people that are that are charging him, and they sentence him to death. Now, normally in um, the ancient world, you'd be you'd be sentenced and then you'd be killed not long afterwards. There's a, a gap uh, for Socrates because there's a religious festival going on. We don't have to look at the details of that very much. It had to do, if you've heard of Theseus and the Minotaur, it had to do with um, a religious festival that was, set, that was set around that. And they'd send a ship out, and, and after the ship came back, then they could execute people again. So they're waiting to execute him. He's sitting in a cell. He's got, you know, lots of free time. Um, and it, was, it wasn't too bad for him. He's you know, reading books and making friends with the jailers and um, just sort of going about his day the way he normally does. People come and visit him. And Credo comes, and Credo has been coming. If you, if you looked at the dialogue a couple times, you realize Credo has been coming during each day at a certain time of the day. He's showing up early this day. And he's showing up early because he's got a breakout of jail plan. So that's, that's where this, this uh, takes off. Um, Socrates could get away. Credo is rich. Credo's a foreigner. Credo has bribed the guards. He's um, arranged for transportation. He's talked things over with people. He's actually got a He proposes a couple different places. You could go to Thessaly. You could go here. You've got friends over here. Um, because Socrates did, in fact, have a lot of friends. So, Credo is putting forth a real proposal for him. Credo's done everything that needs to be done for this. Um, why, why is he doing this? Well, you know, when you read the Apology, did you feel Socrates deserved to die? No? Did anyone feel he deserved to die? Um, if you look at the forum in, in Eiler, you notice that I've started sort of a, a devil's advocate kind of thing. I've started some threads why that guy Socrates deserves to die. And I invite you to, to respond to it. You know, uh, That can be class participation for those who don't like to talk in class too much. Um, or those who actually do talk in class and, and enjoy you know, stirring things up, that you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, most of you don't think he deserves to die. Credo didn't think he deserved to die either. A lot of people didn't think so. They considered it to be what they talk about in this as an unjust verdict. Right? And we have that in our society, right? Some people get sentenced who don't, don't actually deserve to get sentenced. Um, I don't know what the actual proportions are. I can tell you that when I, when I worked in a prison, um, and, and actually I taught philosophy and religious studies in a maximum security prison, and I got to know some of the guys very well because I was teaching the same classes you know, uh, over and over and over again, and they weren't going anywhere. You know, They weren't transferring to other, other places, other schools. They were taking classes with me and, and uh, one other philosophy professor. And we'd talk about all sorts of things, including their cases. And most of the people in our prisons actually are guilty of something. Right? Uh, there are some cases. Uh, if you talk to prisoners, you find out that there's a lot fewer cases than we often think of as, as you know, pure travesties of justice, where the person is innocent and doesn't deserve it at all. Socrates looks like he, he doesn't deserve to die, though. I mean, he made a case that he was doing a good thing for the city. Did any of you find that, that idea convincing, that he was doing something useful? Yeah, a few of you? Were, were you were going to say something? Mom, I think it's, it's more to, like, turn to himself and just kind of teach people the morals that there's no such thing as wisdom unless they are, like, humble about it, like, you can't be talking about it. So yeah. You possess wisdom if you really don't. Those are all things that he was teaching you, right? Um, do you think that that served any purpose in society? Did it make people better? Or, I mean, was he really corrupting people? That was, I mean, they were going to kill him because they thought he was 
corrupting the young. That was the charges. Uh, so the core question that we're going to look at today, that Socrates says, okay, let's think about this, is Credo's plan. Should he do it? Um, we're going to look at the arguments for that. We're going to look at some of the, the basic ideas underlying that. Um, before that, though, I want to talk about a few interesting features of this text. Um, it is connected to the Apology, right? The Euthyphro, by the way, that you're reading for next class, that's also connected in time. That's right before he goes in the law court. So he has one big discussion, then he goes in, gives a speech, then he loses his case, goes to jail, and then the day before he dies, two days before he dies, he talks with Credo. Then there's another dialogue, which we're not going to read, called the Phaedo, which is his last day, the day that he dies, uh, which concludes with him dying, drinking hemlock and being uh, poisoned. Do you guys see any sort of inconsistency with what went on in the Apology? Uh, in, in this dialogue, Socrates, is he going to leave? No. Why not? Yeah. He believes if I against the law, if he believes he doesn't like, want to contradict himself. So he yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're, you're right about on all those, those statements. It's the, the right thing, the just thing to do. He doesn't want to be inconsistent with himself. And it would also be breaking the laws. Um, now, is this consistent with the guy who said, you can put me to death if you want, but I'm never going to stop doing philosophy? Some people, you know, when they first read this, they say, you know, in the Apology, this guy was saying, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. You're not going to stop me. In this one, he's saying, I'm going to go along with what the state says. So is there a contradiction there? Well, he knows what he's doing. He's not illegal in the first place. They're just saying that it is. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. So there isn't a contradiction. No, he's just staying true himself. Okay. Yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Is Yeah, go ahead. I think he just kind of realizes that, like, no matter what, you know, he thinks he's right, he knows he's right, he's not going to get his point across, so he kind of just has to go with whatever happens. In the apology, you're thinking, yeah? Yeah, yeah. There, there are um, Plato scholars who think exactly along the lines that that you've laid out. That Socrates thought he wasn't going to get a fair trial. Period. So he was making sort of a um, what do they call that? A bully pulpit. You know, he was he, he was using it as an opportunity to to say what he he wanted to say one last time and and get it through. Um, maybe even stick it to them a little bit. You know. Um, we, we do get, this is another theme that's in there, we get to see Socrates put to the test. It's one thing to say all sorts of things about morality and justice and, you know, what's right and wrong and, and you know, um, how important it is to stand up for what's true. It's a whole different thing when you're put to the test, isn't it? Have any of you ever experienced situations of temptation where some moral stand that you were taking you found it was difficult to maintain it. You had to do something that was painful. Uh, well, this is really painful. He's going to die. So what he's dying for better be pretty valuable. Um, just being true to yourself, in some sense, I don't know if that's worth dying for. Being true to yourself along the lines of something that matters, maybe that's, that's worth dying for. Um, What's going on? You brought up the laws. You notice that he, he actually makes the laws talk. What do you think is going on with that? This is something that, 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 pe that people have read the dialogue and been fascinated or confused or entertained by it. Why do you think he did that? If you have any views about it. If you, if you don't, maybe you do by the time we get, get through this. I'll, I'll, I'll just let that question kind of sit. Um, another thing to think about that's going to come up this, this semester over and over again is this question of what do you actually owe to your society? Especially if your society isn't perfect, it isn't doing things the way it ought to be. There's something that we call um, civil disobedience. Um, 
Um, have you guys heard this term before? I probably in high school, right? Uh, who do you associate it with? Yeah. Uh, Gandhi. Yeah, Gandhi's a, a great example. Um, who did Gandhi influence that uh, you would put it to work here in the United States? Yeah. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, yeah. Um, anybody before Gandhi that you could think of in America that, that gets tied in with this? This is kind of trivia, but Henry David Thoreau. Have any of you read him? You had to read him in English lit, maybe, or not English lit, American lit, uh, English, an English class. Um, they all talk about this idea of civil disobedience, and they end up taking a different stance than, than Socrates does here in the Credo. Um, if Martin Luther King had, had followed Socrates' lines and said, well, the laws are the laws, and I've benefited by them, so I really don't have any right to transgress, transgress them, then um, would he have marched? Would all those other people have marched with him? Um, they took a different stand, or at least what appears to be a different stand when we first look at it, right? I mean, Martin Luther King also made uh, a distinction between just laws and unjust laws. Just laws you have to follow, unjust laws, it's actually wrong to follow them. And that's in, in a letter, to Bur letter from a Birmingham in jail, which you probably read in high school again. Yeah? No? You should read it. It's, it's important to, to read. Um, he's, Martin Luther King is not basing his stuff on, on Socrates in the Credo, basing it on other philosophical texts. Because Socrates is taking a, a stance that says, well, you know, you owe something to society. You owe something to the state. You can, you can go out there and be a gadfly, but if the state decides it wants to crush the gadfly, then you should go along with it. Um, so we, we, we'll look at that theme a little bit more as well. Um, let's look now at, at the actual text. Um, Credo comes in, and what does he say? You know, first they back and forth about, you know, I've been reading Aesop, and the boat is coming, and all that sort of stuff. But when they really get to the meat of it, um, Credo says, hey, I've got an escape plan for you. Let's do it. You know, here's, here's all the, the ins and outs of it. Um, Socrates says, let's think about this. Credo is, is going to make some appeals. He's going to bring up some, some goods or some values, some things that are going to be lost, if um, Socrates doesn't leave. So, what are, what are the goods at stake here? Obviously, his life, right? To lose his life. What else? What, what is Credo worried about? Yeah. Um, he says how Socrates has to lose his kid. Yeah, that's, that's a good concern, isn't it? Uh, Socrates has a responsibility to educate his kids. You know, and this is in a Iron Age society, uh, which did not have a social welfare system, where if you, you know, Socrates was in the, the free class of citizens uh, who had property, but you could very easily leave that class. Your kids could become slaves um, through going into debt or stuff like that. If you didn't have somebody strong guiding the house, bringing the kids up right, who knows what would happen to the kids. It's not like the state was going to take charge of them. Um, or, you know, social services or whatever, whatever they call it here in New York uh, would come in. So that's a real concern. So if Socrates allows himself to die, he's not going to be able to do that. What else? What are other values, other concerns that come up? Yeah? And then Krita talk about like, people looking down upon him because he has yeah. to save him. Um, we'll call that reputation. And he talks about something that um, he's going to have to endure when he loses his reputation, shame. That's a powerful motivator, isn't it? Nobody wants to be ashamed. Um, you, 
can get a, you can get people to put up with a lot of things that are painful or that hurt their interests if you don't shame them. Um, but if you do shame them, that sometimes hurts people worse than any other thing. Um, you know, think about bullying, for example. This is sort of a digression. Um, you have these cases where these kids are bullied, especially through electronic media, and then what do they do? Why does it become an issue? They complain, the school says, ah, don't do that anymore. That's not how, how it goes. What do they do that really gets everybody's attention? They kill themselves. Yeah. They, they choose death over shame. Because shame is that strong of a social motivator even in our day. Um, they're, not, they're, they're not really acting like Socrates is doing that. They're maybe making a, a misguided decision. But it's one that's understandable, isn't it? Um, what else? What are some other values? Doesn't want to look like, like a, a bad guy who prefers money to his friends. Um, is there anything else that, that he thinks is going to be lost? You're getting a good list here. Um, what's the first thing he says? I'm going to lose... He doesn't say my reputation. I'm going to lose somebody that I, I can't replace. A great friend. friend. So, friendship. It's hard to be friends with a dead person. Yeah. Why would he lose his good reputation if he refused to escape? Um, Credo's worried about his own reputation. Um, so I should probably clarify. This is Credo's loss. This is also Credo's loss. This is Socrates' okay. loss. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, there's, there, there is one thing that's like that. that again, you gotta, you're not going to catch this the first time that you read the text. This is why we have these, these sessions. Why I talk about you know reading the text multiple times. Um, Credo says, Socrates, you're taking the easy way out. So it's not just Credo whose reputation is up for you know debate. Um, it's also Socrates. So bless you, Socrates. You're taking the easy way out by letting them kill you. Um, sounds a little strange that way. Well, what's his reasoning? You're not consistently following the path that you've actually laid out, the path of goodness, the path of virtue, the path of courage, you know, you should be courageous and leave the city. Take a chance. Come and live in Thessaly. You know, um, you shouldn't let, you shouldn't let those, those, um, those enemies of yours win. If you do, there's something wrong with you, Socrates. That's what Credo is, is saying if you're reading between the lines. Um, actually, this is kind of a, a digression, too. Credo, we don't know this from this dialogue. We know this from another dialogue. He's a really emotional guy. So um, you can just picture Credo there kind of, you know, shaking and expostulating with, with Socrates. He has to, he, Credo has to be led away crying when Socrates actually does die, whereas the other really people stick around. Um, there's kind of a mistaken attitude on Credo's part. Socrates is pointing out. What's the mistake? The big what? If you had to just identify one thing that's wrong with Credo's reasoning, one main thing that ties it together, what is Socrates criticizing for? He says you're, you're thinking about the wrong thing here. What is it? Give you a hint. Who should Credo be listening to or thinking about how they, they would see things? Yeah. Himself? Well, Credo doesn't actually know. And Socrates himself in this one is kind of humble. He, he doesn't claim that he, <coughs> he himself knows. Um, let, me, let me change the question. Who shouldn't he be listening to? There's a there's sort of catchphrase in there. Who gets it wrong? 
who thinks that these things are all really, really important? Credo. Credo does, but he's getting that from somebody or from some group of people. Society? Yeah, we would call it society. Um, in the credo, it's called the many. Um, the sort of you know mass of people uh, that you just sort of pick, and, and you know they're not necessarily people who thought things through. As a matter of fact, they're probably going along with whatever happens to be popular at the time. You know, think about um, the way mobs behave. You know. They, uh, you don't look at mobs for moral guidance, right? The mobs do things. Um, think about the way many people can be persuaded by easy emotional appeals. Um, and actually, you know, quite frankly, most people don't like to think very long and hard about things. These things right here are values. They are good. But are they the real good? Are they what's, what's truly valuable for somebody... Uh, like Socrates, um, Credo is too concerned about what the many think. And there's sort of a common temptation that Credo is exemplifying. I know I've fallen prey to this temptation myself. I suspect that many of you have probably fallen prey to it as well. You know what's right and what's wrong. But there's this tendency to say, you know, in this case, the rules don't apply. In this case, I, I got to look at other goods that have to be served. Now, you know, across the board, it still applies. Uh, for instance, what's, you know, shouldn't be mean to people, right? But maybe there's times you should be mean to people. But it, let's take a, a one that, that uh, is, is probably easy to relate to. You shouldn't lose your temper and swear at people. Should you? Can we, can we all agree that you shouldn't do that? Does anybody think you, that that's a good thing to do? That you ought to be doing that? That you're not living life fully if you're not doing that? Um, there are some people who, who think that. You know, you can tell because the way they live their life. They get mad and swear at people a lot. Um, now, when do we get mad and swear at people, usually? Just when we think they're doing something wrong. Yeah, exactly. We, if, if, we th if they hurt us, but we think that we actually had it coming, we, we may get a little mad, but we don't get mad like when we think that they, they're doing something really wrong to us. And if it's not right for us to get mad and swear at people, it's not right across the board. But there's this tendency to say, well, you know, you did something to me first, so I get to do this in this case, and that's okay for me. Credo's doing something like that. It's okay to break the laws, if the laws don't turn out the way you want them to. If the verdict doesn't, doesn't play out the way you want, then, you know, you should, re, you know, re resort to other things. What does that do to a society if you, if too many people start doing that? Let's say with the legal system. If, if too many people start saying, I'll, I'll accept the court verdict provided it goes my way, but if it doesn't, I'm going to find some way to undermine it. Can, can a society work like that? No. No. Rules have to be honored by, by at least most people, or else things break down. Uh, so credo is, is a little bit, you know, mistaken. Socrates says, um, we have to think about, is this the right thing to do? And are we going to look at what the many say? No, um, we have to look at what somebody else would say. Um, and he says, we need to know whether this is the right thing to do in this situation, but also in other situations. Right? Um, who is Socrates going to be persuaded by? He's not going to be persuaded by Credo or the many. Does that mean that he's just stubborn? I take my stand here, and nobody will, will uh, convince me otherwise. Is that a rational way to behave? No? So, if it's not the many, because they don't really know what they're talking about, and they make all sorts of, you know, goofy decisions, and believe all sorts of 
things one day and then all sorts of other things the next day. Who should he get his uh, his verdict from? Who should he look to? Yeah. Um, that would yeah that would be an interesting thing. He doesn't in this case. If he were to do that, then that would be sort of pushing the, the problem upstairs to, to God, right? And some people do do that. Socrates is notable in part for not doing that. Um, and you might say that one of the ways to divide philosophy apart from another discipline called theology, I, they don't teach theology classes here, do they? Because it's, it's a private school, but it's not a Catholic school. Um, with theology, you, you look to God. And then you try to figure out what God is actually saying and, and make some sense of it. We're going to look at that a little bit with the Euthyphro uh, next class. What Socrates is doing, he thinks that the answer is within us if we look close enough, or within him, uh, within the human mind. He, he wants to get his information, he wants to get his advice from somebody who actually does know, somebody who actually is wise. And notice, he's not claiming himself to be wise in this, this dialogue. He's just claiming to have certain principles that he, he thinks are right, and unless somebody can prove those principles don't hold, he's going to stick with them. Um, so who do we want? We want the person who knows about good and evil and what should be done. Um, now, what I'd like you to do, just for a, a minute or so, Think to yourself um, about some case in your life where you relied on, <clears throat> you had to make a decision about something right and wrong. You made the wrong decision. And the reason that you did so is because you looked at what everybody else thought about it, or the way everybody else felt, or how people might look at you <clears throat> if you didn't make the decision that you did. And it seemed okay at the time, um, but then you realized later it wasn't the right thing to do. Maybe it had some bad consequences, or maybe you felt you know, remorse about it afterwards. Um, think about that for a minute. You know, um, a lot of this stuff makes more sense when you apply it within the context of your own life. All of you can relate to that, right? Have you all had an experience like that? At least one in your lifetime, even if it's something as trivial as as um, picking on some kid because all the other kids were picking on that kid, yeah. um, or stealing it, you know, stealing candy because your peer group said we're going in to steal candy today. You want to hang out with us? You got to steal candy. Yeah, I remember doing that when I was like in second grade. Um, <laughs> I was so nervous too because uh, I was I was hanging out with the third graders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to be cool and hang with the third graders, you had to do the things that the third graders were doing. And they were in shoplifting at the time. Shoplifting candy, which is pretty you small. Third graders robbing stores. Yeah, well, things have changed since I was a kid. Um, I mean, we lived way out in the country. And uh, we, we, we had this, uh, this it was, now we'd, we'd call it a convenience store, right? And they had like a candy aisle. And one of the kids went to the front and... Uh, Got a got a uh, bought something, so he had a bag, and then he walked back by us, and then we were supposed to take the candy and like put it in the bag, and it was a fiasco because you know what are we doing? We're dropping it in, and it's really noisy, and like the, the clerk is over there looking at us, and and I you know I was I was just thinking to myself, oh god, we're gonna get caught, we're gonna get caught, you know my parents are gonna kill me. Um, we didn't get caught, and you know the candy. There's actually an expression. There's there's no. Uh, food so sweet is food that you've stolen. And it was pretty sweet, but you know, you think about it. You think about it later on. Was that the right thing to do? No. Right? Did did the fact that my my older compatriots said, "Yeah, everybody's doing this," that make it a good thing to do? No. Uh, and I can think of my, for myself a lot of big things along the way that I've done, where fo rather foolishly I I listened to um, people that I shouldn't have listened to. And then you, you know, um, reap the fruits. All of you can think of something like that, right? In your life. Um, who could you have gone to? 
you know, Socrates doesn't tell you in this dialogue who actually does know. He gives you some characteristics of the person that, that would know. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. I, I like just we'll, we'll, we'll actually do a little, you know, dialogue back and forth about that when we get to that. But keep this in the back of your head as we're going through the rest of this. Who would have known in the situation that you found yourself what the right thing to do was? Who would have given you the, the good advice? Um, we're going to skip over how the many actually go wrong. Um, what's really key here in, in this, this discussion about you know who knows and who doesn't know? Um, whenever we find ourselves in a tough situation, like Socrates is in, we have to actually ask ourselves, what is to be done? That question that he asks in the text. Uh, because we don't always know. That's what we call um, practical reasoning. The part of philosophy that's called ethics, you guys are later on down the line going to take a higher level ethics class when you're juniors and seniors. Um, hopefully you're, you're going to you know, learn some things about ethics before you get to be juniors and seniors so you can make some good ethical decisions on the way, right? Um, that is all concerned with what, what ought to be done. What should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? In this case, you know, it's a particular problem should Socrates leave and, and break the, the rules of the city. Um, Socrates says that a good life is to be valued. Not just these things. Not just life by itself, but a good life. And there's a lot of different ways to answer the question, what is the good life? Which is a question of ethics again. Ethics is not just about right and wrong, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. It's also about what kind of life you think is good for human beings to, to live. Um, you know, I think all of you want to be successful, right? You're, you're all planning to have careers? That's part of why you're in college? That would be a component of the good life for you, wouldn't it? Would, it, would that be the only thing you require for the good life, to have a career? There are some people I talked about this earlier today in my ethics class, who see the good life precisely in terms of work and just work. Um, maybe some of you know some people like that. Are they, are they getting the whole picture? What, what, what goes wrong in those sort of cases? What kind of I mean, they're, they're pursuing a real good, a genuine good. They do it a little bit too much. There's no balance. Okay, that's, you, that's a good place to start with. There's no balance. So if, if we've got, when you have a balance, you have some sort of thing in the middle, and then you have two sides. Um, work over here. What's what's on the other side that should be there? Yeah. It's like, like play, I guess, like work and play. All, yeah, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You, um, you're next. In that I was going to say family. Yeah, usually people who are what we call workaholics, their family lives suffer, they have higher rates of divorce, their kids, you know, later on say, you were never there for me. Um, what were you going to say? I was going to say family. Family? That's probably one of the greatest damages that takes place. They also don't develop, um, you know, when, when we play, we develop other aspects of ourselves. Um, and, you know, if you're a workaholic, you also won't be enjoying some, some other goods. You won't be developing yourself. Um, all of you know people like that, right? They, they've made some sort of mistake with respect to what the good life is. Socrates thinks that um, the good life, he says, is a life that's just and honorable. That's what makes life good for him, fundamentally. So if he has to choose between being just and educating his kids, he's going to take being just, doing the right thing. Um, there are plenty of people who would be perfectly fine with doing the wrong thing so long as it, it helps your kids, right? Again, you probably know people who have done that. My mom would actually, um, she, she, would, she was very hard on us as kids, but... Um, 
she had no problem about lying to people so long as it, you know, opened up opportunities for us. Um, I thought that was a little weird myself. Um, but you know people like that, right? Um, Socrates thinks that if it, if it can't be a just life, it's almost worse than, than not living. Just and honorable. That's what he wants to be. So that's what's, what's motivating him. The other thing is, um, how, is he finding, how is he finding all these things out? The reasoning. Um, and this is not something that's talked about in the dialogue, but this is going to be a theme with us over the semester. When we use this word reason, we have a couple different meanings for this, right? Uh, why are you here? You have a reason to be here because you're taking a class for, for credits. So that's one sense of the term reason. But you are also rational, right? You are a human being, and because you're a human being, you are a reasoning being. You are a rational being. That's why, you know, we, we have classrooms and we talk about these sorts of things. Um, dogs, you know, get trained. Do dogs teach each other in classrooms? Give each other grades? Tell each other how they ought to progress? That they ought to be, you know, reading this text or something like that? No, we do that. We reason about things. We reason about things on all different levels. Sometimes we do it poorly and sometimes we do it well, but that's part of that's what makes us distinctively human. Uh, one of the definitions for human being that came up early in philosophy is the rational animal. So Socrates thinks that this is part of what makes us most human, being rational, following reason. Not just following our, our, our desires, um, but following reason, what reason tells us is the right thing to do. And he's going to follow it out. Here's where it gets really interesting. Reason itself, the rational life, is a good thing. So you can put that into the balance. When, you know, when you're doing practical reasoning, a lot of what you're doing is weighing. Does, does this side weigh more? Well, then I should do this action. Does this side weigh more? Then I should do this action. For Socrates, one of the things that's really heavy, that's pushing down the scale, is being rational, being consistent, sticking with what he had said before. Um, now, he, he has a, sort of a standard to appeal to, the wise man. And what is the wise man wise about? Here's where I want to introduce another theme that you're going to see come up throughout the semester as well. We call these moral values. And um, they're, they're you know, instantiated. They take certain forms. Uh, we can debate about them. We, in fact, do debate about them. The next dialogue that we're going to read, we're going to see not only do we debate about them, we get angry at each other about them. Uh, what do we get angry at each other about? What do we debate about when it comes to moral things? You could say abortion. Euthanasia, right? Those are topics. What is the real general thing? We, we don't ask ourselves, abortion, yes or no. We say, is abortion right or just? Just or unjust, right? Um, we can also ask the, whether things are good or Bad. And maybe just and, and good might be the same thing in some cases. Um, but maybe they're not in some cases, you know? All of you are healthy, I, I think, right? I hope so. Being healthy is good. Being sick is bad. It's not that you become an unjust person by being unhealthy. But it's not good for you to be unhealthy, is it? Um, Socrates says that the, the person we want to look to, the wise person, is somebody who knows about the just and the unjust, the good and the bad, and then he uses some other terms. Can you remember what those terms were? He uses kind of a formula. And he says, the 
just and the unjust, the good and the bad, and, and he changes, uh, or at least the translator changes the, the terms that he uses. Yeah? It's the wise and the unwise. Well, that, the wise is the one who actually knows about this, and the unwise is the one who ha is all mixed up about it. Or th they think that they've got the right thing, but they're mixed, you know, they've got a wrong viewpoint on it. Um, yeah? Say again? Well, we could change this to evil if we wanted to, um, and, and that's good. The Greek terms are pretty malleable. You can, you can make them fit things. Um, he uses another thing that we wouldn't normally think of as moral, but in terms of what we call aesthetic, um, how things appear to us. Um, he uses terms like this. The, Foul. Oh, that's the uh, wrong side. <laughs> the fair or the foul. Everything on this side is, is bad. Everything on this side is good, right? Um, he doesn't mean fair in the sense of, you know, you, you each person gets like a candy bar and you don't, you know, take anything more than is your due or anything like that or everyone, you know, follows the rules. He means fair as in uh, beautiful. Another way of translating this is beautiful or ugly. Another way of translating it is uh, noble or base. And another way that he does it in this is honorable or dishonorable. Uh, why do you think that that's important for somebody to know about? Isn't that kind of weird? I mean, for somebody to be a good ethics guide, sure, they ought to be able to tell you what's right and wrong. They ought to know that. They ought to know what's, what's good and what's bad. Why should they know things about, you know, like what's noble and what's base? Um, you know, we don't use terms like that. We talk about people as being, you know, like a, a decent person or you know, repugnant, or a stand-up guy, uh, or a punk, you know. Uh, we have all sorts of terms for these sorts of things. Those are more in this category than in the category of the just or the unjust. Um, you know what's lying behind this idea? Goodness is attractive. And evil is in some way discordant or ugly. And it might appear beautiful from this side, or noble from this side, but then you, you take a walk around it and you see that it's not. Um, with any of these things, you can distinguish between what's apparently that and what's really that. And the person who knows, who is wise, would know about all these sorts of things. How do you think they find out about that? Well, for Socrates, it was through reasoning. Not just listening to the crowd, not just accepting things for you know on face value, but actually thinking about them. Um, that's how he got himself in trouble. Going around looking for the person who could meet these criteria. So when he was going around to all these politicians, isn't this the sort of stuff that politicians ought to be knowledgeable about? What's really just and unjust? And if they turned out not to be so, that's why they got angry. So that's, that's why, that's the kind of person that he's looking for. That person doesn't show up in this dialogue. So you have to ask yourself, you know, here, here's a good place for us to actually sort of pause. Think back to the mistake that you made. Um, who should you have listened to? Is there somebody who would have been knowledgeable, or at least more knowledgeable, than where you were at the time? about what was just and unjust, what was good or bad, what was honorable or dishonorable. Who could you think of? Probably not an ethics professor, right? Who in your life would you have gone to? Like, I know, you know, I had, I had some grandparents I wouldn't go to for something, something like that. And my grandpa on my dad's side, he wouldn't have been a good guy to right and wrong. He did terrible things. 
and didn't, you know, and bragged about it. Now his wife, his long-suffering wife, um, his second long-suffering wife, actually, uh, she was a very good, you know, moral voice. I could go to her. Did you have people like that in your life? Yeah. Who do you have now? Again, you know, most likely it's not going to be your ethics professor or your intro to philosophy professor. Who do you go to to find out when you have to figure out what's right and wrong? Because you're not, you know, a genius at this, right? Yeah. No, my parents. Yeah, and if your parents actually truly, you know, do know, Socrates would say, perfect, you found them. Um, somebody like this is a solid goal. Um, yeah. Even when you were a kid, though, you could have just asked yourself, well, what's the right thing to do? You knew that it was wrong what you were doing, so you didn't really need to ask anybody. Yeah. All you need to do is think about it. Yeah, and you, and you know, um, Socrates seems to think that something along those lines, that deep in our heart of hearts, we actually, you know, could figure it out. But, it, but it's buried under a lot of stuff. Um, there's one problem with that, too. There are, and, and Plato doesn't think about this, there are some people that we, we nowadays term as sociopaths. Sociopaths lack a sense of conscience. And that's why they're so dangerous. And that's why they don't respond to treatment, because they, they don't care. Um, they're only interested in, in you know, certain goods, like power and pleasure and things like that. And they'll do anything that it takes to get it. Um, we're going to look at that a little bit more when we look, look at Republic Book, Book One. Um, that, I, I'd like you to keep thinking about that, this, this notion of who should you go to. That, that's, you know, there are certain big ideas that when the semester's over, and um, actually when, when you've left Maris, I would really, really like you to carry with you. Um, I don't expect that you're going to remember most of what we actually cover in class. Because people don't. Um, that's what you have your notes for, things like that. There are certain issues, certain basic ideas that I'd really like you to have as part of your toolkit when you leave here. And one of those is this notion of who should I place my trust in? Who should I be getting my understanding of moral values from? Because that's a project that you, each one of you as an individual, as a developing human being, as one who's actually early in your development, all of you are around, you know, 18, 19 maybe. Um, this is something that you should, you know, um, think very carefully about. Because you don't want to be 40 years old and realizing that you made the wrong decisions with this down the line. Um, what else is important about this, this dialogue? Socrates... Um, He brings up the laws, right? What do the laws say to him? What is Socrates saying to himself and to Credo uh, and putting in the mouth of the Athenian laws? They're pretty hard on him, aren't they? I mean, he could have set up the, the, the dialogue like this, the law is saying, Socrates, don't break us. Socrates says, screw you. I'm breaking you. Uh, he didn't. The laws make arguments. They give you reasons why he should stay around and obey. What are those reasons? Can you remember any of them? Yeah. That they like educated him and they like raised him. Yeah. Um, they provided. They not only educated and raised him. They provided the very framework in which that could happen, in which his parents could marry and he could be legitimate. Um, that sounds like something that you know you ought to repay somebody for. Anything else? Yeah. Can you like, compare yourself to like, a slave, almost like a slave of the law? And kind of, like, like, yeah. Yeah, now in the ancient world, uh, the laws compare themselves to mothers and fathers. In the ancient world, things were uh, quite a bit different in the relationship between children and parents than they are for most of us. Um, Parents were had a much higher status compared to their, their children, and there wasn't a lot of you know democracy in the household, or you know what do you think, little Johnny, you know about this or that. It was the parents decided because they're the ones who made you, and uh, some parents will actually say, "I made you, and I can unmake you," you know, or things like that. The laws are sort of like super parents. 
they made the parents. So, you know, Socrates, yeah, the laws are saying he's like a slave. Um, what else? There, there's something that we brought up earlier. They say, what are you doing? Are you going by an act of yours to overturn us, the laws in the whole state? Do you imagine a state can subsist and not be overthrown in which the decisions of law have no power, but are set aside and overthrown by individuals? If Socrates does the wrong thing in this case, it has, it has repercussions for the society, doesn't it? We just talked about this a little bit. Could a society last if everyone says, well, I'll accept the laws so long as the, you know, it turns out in my favor? As soon as it doesn't, I'm, I'm going to break them. Can you have a society like that? Can you even play a game like that? You know, let, let's say we're playing, uh, what do you want to play? Baseball, football, hockey, anything. With, well, let's say chess, right? Do you ever play chess with somebody who cheats? It's very hard to cheat at chess. How would you do it? You'd have to break a rule. You'd have to like say, um, well, you know, uh, my pawn can actually move like a queen. There's not much of a game if people do that. Um, and, you know, you won't, you won't be able to play. Sooner or later, you can't tell anything apart. Um, the laws also say, what was our agreement with you? When you entered into the courtroom, what were you agreeing to? Were you to abide by the sentence of the state? Um, if you don't like the way things go in your state, Socrates, then why did you stick around for 70 years? If you think the laws are bad laws, why didn't you go off to Sparta? You keep talking, they say this in the dialogue, you keep saying that Sparta and Crete have better laws than us, because Socrates and, and Plato were actually sort of uh, critics of democracy. Athens was a democracy. Sparta was... Um, uh, depending on how you want to see it, an oligarchy or an aristocracy. Not everybody got to vote, not everybody got to hold office. Um, so, you know, if, if Socrates didn't like it, why didn't he go somewhere else? As a matter of fact, he, he uh, liked it so much, the laws say, that you never left. The only time you ever left was to go on military service. Everybody else, you know, they go on vacation somewhere. You, didn't, you went on vacation here. Uh, what do they call it? A staycation, right? Uh, that, that's the new term for when you, you take off work and you just sit around the house and watch TV or play games, eat chips, um, and don't go into work. Um, so what do you think? Do, do the laws have a good case? Do they have a good case for Socrates? Yes? Or no? Yes? Why? Why do you think so? Uh, um, because I guess that's a good point. Like, if you don't like the world so much, why do you stick around for so long? That's a pretty valid point. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder to emigrate these days. It used to be a lot easier back then. Um, what else? Any of, you other, any of you have other reasons for finding this convincing? Or do you think that the laws are wrong? So I he's making the wrong choice. Yeah. Well, you didn't. Um, what do you think? All of you have an opinion, I know. People, when they read this text, they're, they're you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, this is great. And sometimes they're like, this is, this is absolute BS. I can't believe that, that they, you know, they'd go along with this fascist stuff. Those are two extreme positions. Let's put it a different way, then. Um, so if Socrates, let's say Socrates does owe this to the state. Um, what about you and the society that we live in? Who do you owe things to? All of you have debts. And I don't just mean, you know, financial aid, you know. Do you guys have, to, you guys have loans? A lot of you? To go here? And if 
loans aren't paying it, then scholarships of some sort, or mom and dad. And if it's mom and dad, come Thanksgiving, uh, if you're spouting stuff at the dinner table about you know how American society is fascist or you know is terrible or something like that, they'll they'll remind you who's paying for your education, <coughs> and that you owe them something. And if you decide to, to uh, you know not major in business as you originally planned and to major in art history instead, you may get a call from mom or dad saying, I'm shelling out you know, all this money for your education. You owe me. So there's, there's that, but who else do you owe things to? Let's think about the fabric of society. Um, all of you are healthy. All of you are relatively well adjusted, I'm, I'm assuming. You know, you, you didn't go through war. You know, you weren't, you know, the victim of chronic crime or stuff like that. Do you owe anybody for, for that? Yeah. Our country. Yeah. The country as a whole, um, you know, we just had this big 9-11 thing, the 10-year anniversary. And the FBI was on high alert. Um, agents were called in for the entire <coughs> weekend to work, you know, double shifts and stuff like that. Um, they had people on the bridges around here, um, making sure that, you know there wasn't any funny business going on with that. Police presence was stepped up everywhere. Um, it becomes much more visible. They actually put out some communiques because they didn't want people to get alarmed that some of the police would actually have automatic weapons, which they did. Um, why do they have that? To protect us. Do we owe them anything? Well, it's their job. <laughs> well, that's a good point. And, and, it's honorable, uh, but it's their job. Yeah. I, and, and when it comes to uh, the military, I'm actually a vet myself. And um, my attitude when I hear people say, um, you know, troops shouldn't be put in harm's way is, uh, what do you think you signed up for? You know, you, you take the money, you take the oath, uh, you, you, you're probably going to be put in harm's way. And it's the same with police or who else, firefighters. Um, who else is on the front lines, you know, keeping you safe, the organs of society, we call them. What about nurses and doctors? Nurses more than doctors, though. Nurses face, you know, the chance of getting all sorts of horrible diseases on a daily basis if, if something goes wrong. We don't think of that as a huge risk like a, you know, a firefighter or a, or a police officer, but... They're, they're facing that. Do we owe them anything? What do you think? It could just be their job. We owe them money. We owe them, maybe we owe them honor, you know, or respect. Our country provides all this stuff. What what do we owe our country? At, at a minimum, what, what do you think you owe? Taxes. Well, yeah. <laughs> And that fluctuates depending on how much you make. Well, you guys right now are fortunate, most of you I'm guessing, in that um, you're, not, you're not making a lot of money because you'll see the more money you make, the bigger the bite gets very, very quickly. Um, you don't have to make very much to be considered middle class anymore. So taxes. Um, let's, go, let's say we go a little bit broader. That's providing support to the country. Um, there are laws about taxes, right? You have to follow the laws. Do you have to follow all the other laws? Sure. What if you don't like the laws? What, is, what does the credo hold out as a possibility? The laws actually say this. So you can't break us just because you don't like us. What are you going to say? Oh, you're just playing with your pen. Okay. Um, what should you do if you don't like the, the laws? What do you have a duty to do? Yeah. You can change the laws. You could try to... Um, you could try to get into politics and, and change them to become one of the, the rulers. Uh, the credo as a dialogue doesn't actually have a law saying that. There, there's another way to change laws, though, and that's to, to do what? Go ahead. Write a bill. 